So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're as, you'll be as keen as I am to hear from Steve, and we welcome him and look forward to your thoughts. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, David, for the kind introduction and, and to the Western Alliance for the opportunity. In the spirit of big data, you'll see there's a Twitter address, Twitter handle up here, and I've already had some back and forth tweeting. If you feel like being a twit, please go ahead and use that address. Um, if you've been following Twitter this morning, you'll know that there's a joke about Kermit and the bicycle. It's only available, the answer, the punchline is only available on Twitter. So if you don't like me, you don't get to find out the answer to the joke. Apologies about that. I realise people are having their lunch and uh, big data has a pretty bad reputation. People see big data as scary, people see it as frightening, people think it's a really serious issue, Big Brother is watching. I just want to allay your fears a bit and start pointing to how big data is actually a good thing. Can I get a slide, please? Oh, there we go. Oh. So this is what we think of when we think about big data, and this is T2, this is Skynet and the computers taking over. The computers are taking over a bit, but I think there's a good chance that they're going to help us. If you don't tweet, this guy's coming around to see you because he knows where you live. <laughs> So let me put this a different way. Let's use a slightly more user-friendly version of, of, of big data or scary. What I'd like to do is, is to talk to you in really four sections. One, I'm going to just lay the grounds about the problem we have in understanding health. And you've heard a little bit this morning about efforts, efforts to collect data and efforts to understand population health and issues of cost and size and sampling and delays in feedback and so on and so on and so on. I just want to make that case a little bit. I'm then going to tell you a story of some work we've done from the US and the potential for using big data to understand population health. While I'm doing that, think about the potential in Australia. So the reason we've done it in the US is because it was easy. That doesn't mean it's going to be any harder here. So just bear in mind as I'm talking, I'm talking about work we've done in the US, but think about it in your context. This just shows access to the internet for the Australian population over the last uh, 20 or so years. And I think it's an important point to make that 80% of the Australian population have access to the internet in some form uh, when 2011, the most recent sort of data that were available. And of course, this is far higher now. The point is that basically the internet is ubiquitous. Most people here have probably been looking at the internet during um, the talks this morning, more often than not tweeting or other things. You get the internet to your phone now in a regular way and most people use it. Now let me make the point about data. These are the best uh, representative data we have about adult obesity in Australia. And what it says is obesity is going up in adults and what it says is it's going up roughly the same in men and women across the whole country. What it also says is we've only got three data points. We've only really got three points in time where we can say, well, in 1994 it was this, in 2005 it was this, and in 2013 it was this. These data have just been released. So the data were collected in 2013. We're only just finding out what the prevalence is in 2015. Now what's happened in the interim period? Who knows? I'm a policy maker and I'm, if I'm a good one, if I'm a good minister, I'm on a three year election cycle. I can't wait three years to find out whether or not something I did worked. That's just simply too long. Let me show you this a different way. Second most complicated slide, nobody panic. Ready? Here we go. There's a lot going on here and I, and I appreciate that. Across the bottom is time. Up the left hand side is the prevalence of obesity which relates to the green line that does the kind of wavy business. This is Cuba where they have much better data than us and what you can see in the green line is when they hit the economic crisis at about 1990, in other words none of the rest of the world would deal with them and their economy tanked. Look at what happens to obesity rates. They drop from somewhere around 15% to 8% and then they head back up again. What you can see, if you look at the red dotted line that starts up the top, is actually heart disease mortality follows the same trend. So the drop in obesity that was caused by an economic crisis actually had a major positive effect on heart disease mortality. Now that's a kind of a natural experiment We've got three data points for the last 30 years. For all we know, that's happened in parts of Australia and we just don't know. There's every chance that different communities in Australia have been successful in preventing different diseases and we just don't have a clue. 
because we can't track it and we can't, can't track it in a, in a meaningful way that can give us data that we can use. So what's the problem? Well, apart from issues of spelling and, and education, I guess, um, our regional risk and outcome data, typically we do this by a representative survey, which means we have to raise a furious amount of money, convince somebody else that they'll let us into whatever setting it is we're going to collect the data, collect the data, apologise for the fact we only collected 30% of the people we wanted, go back and clean it, wonder why a kid writes their name as Bill when it says William on the electoral roll, double enter it, double check it, take out all the kids who lie about their age, their weight, their height, their diet, where they live, etc, etc, clean it again, wonder why it doesn't make any sense and then start feeding it back. On a good day, in a good project, that's somewhere between 9 and 12 months. And again, if I'm trying to make informed decisions about what sort of intervention to run, about policy, that's useless. All I can do is describe the fact we've got a crisis and why isn't anyone doing something about it and, and cause more of a problem than, than creating a solution. These are usually cross-sectional, so you can't do anything about cause. There's a lot of difficulties in sampling and, of course, they cost an absolute fortune. What you heard Claudia talk about this morning in this room, if you're in the room, is us trying to create a um, sustainable system where the capacity comes from the local uh, community, but also one where the feedback loop between data collection and use is really short. So using tablets to collect data on kids, from collecting the data to telling that community what the behaviours and the outcomes are, is two weeks. That's pretty good, but for some interventions that's still maybe too long, but it's much better than the two years it normally takes. So what if big data, whatever that is, provided a good proxy for population behaviours? What if there was something that was already happening out there in big data world that we could use that might give us real-time feedback, that might give us shorten those feedback cycles and give us a good understanding? I'm going to talk now about the US project that we did, um, and I just really want to highlight... I hope this is the laser. It is good. I just want to highlight the co-authors. Um, they're all very, very important in this project, so I stress this isn't just my work. Um, and I just want to show you this. This is the WHO Causes of NCD framework. So our old friends, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, heart outcomes are on the right-hand end here. Intermediate risk factors are typically the things you're screened for, diagnosed with and intervened upon, dyslipidemia, obesity, and so on and so on. Intermediate risks, common modifiable risks, diet, physical inactivity and so on. And there are 22 different terms in this picture. To do a survey of these 22 different terms and get a decent representative sample is something very few countries on earth are able to do ever, let alone in a routine way. So just bear that in mind as we progress. What we did is we took um, Google Trends, which took those 22 seed terms from that picture I just showed you, so there are 22 terms there, and then we looked across the whole United States for evidence of people searching those seed terms. And for each term, we took the 100 most closely associated terms. So when I do a web search for something, I search for that term, and then it leads me to think, actually, I need to search for something else, and something else, and something else. So for each of those 22 terms, we found the 100 most associated terms for each of those, um, and we then pulled those terms, giving us about 1,500 terms. What we then did is for each of the different risks, we looked at the search frequency for those 100 terms over the last 15 years. Okay, so what we're asking is, for the terms people search when they search a risk factor or an outcome or a modifiable risk, what are the other things they search for and how often are those searched and we only use Google, I should stress, but Google's 80% of the market. When we did this and when I was writing up this paper, I was thinking, I don't know if I really buy that there's any relationship between what I look at on the internet and my behaviour. And I was writing this up in a, in a hotel in Singapore, as you do, and I was thinking, I don't know that I get this, I've got to go for a run. What did I do? I opened Google, and I typed in running tracks near me. And then I thought, yeah, but you're a middle class bloke, you know, overseas doing all that business, it's probably not real. The Friday of that week I was home and I'd been working again and it was late and I opened the fridge, there's nothing in there. I thought, I'm going to get a pizza. What did I do? I googled pizza and I looked for my local pizza store and so on and so on. So the hypothesis we're, at, we're, we're uh, testing is whether or not a community's web search behaviour 
acts as a decent proxy for actual behaviour? That's the question we're trying to ask here. Um, so what we did is we did this for 50 states of the US. So what we've got in terms of an exposure, if you want to think of it like that, is their search activity for each of those terms over a period of time. Just to give you a sense of what those search terms look like, these are the search terms that people search when they also search for alcohol. Thankfully, I wasn't aware of this until I did this project, but when you search for heart disease, another of the most common terms is impotence. So a bloke searches for heart disease and then says, hold on, what's impotence? I'd better find out about that. that that's not good. And then these are the terms associated with obesity, and I can go on and on and on, but what you can see is that there's a range of terms associated with each of those terms. Okay. So what about the behavioural side of it? We're interested in non-communicable disease, and the, and the best, and this is another reason why the US study was so good for us, really the best routine data collection of that whole suite of uh, behaviours and outcomes is the BRFSS, which is the Behavioural Risk Factor Surveillance System. It's been running from 2004 till the current time. Um, so 2012, sorry, this is a little bit out of date, but we just looked till 2012. Um, it collects data on all of those different things, both through a phone interview survey and also through um, home visits. They collect it from around about 600,000 people across the US every year, and it's a rolling survey. So they're constantly in the field, so the data are always updated. What we did then, what we did then, what we did then, what we did then is we put the two things together. So we used a machine learning technique because obviously there's some, something in the region of five and a half billion searches is not something you can put in Excel and chew on in a day. It's a quite difficult thing to do. So we used machine learning techniques to say, build us a model in the first year that explains the relationship between these hundred search terms and the outcome of interest. What's the model and how does that work? And then what we did is we said, OK, using that model, predict next year, next year's um, measured outcome, and learn. What did you get wrong model? Fix yourself. Then predict the next year, and then predict the next year. So what we did is build what's known as a machine learning model. It makes a prediction, and then it adjusts itself based on error year on year. So in theory, it should get smarter. Um, so in, in terms of this, we've got a derived model for the NCD variable which comes from looking at people's web activity data and we've got actual hard outcome measures and each of these are at a state level, okay? So we're saying for each state, what's the actual prevalence of a behaviour? What do we get in terms of modelling it if we use people's web access data? And then we check whether how those things match up together. There's a lot here, it's just showing you what the model is. The, the key to this is really the idea of a lasso constraint, and in English that just means the learning of the model. So it gets bigger or smaller depending on what it learns. Now let me show you some of the results. Um, we've done this for every single state, but this sort of tells you what we're dealing with. So this is Alabama is the state. I've picked that because they're quite obese. It's a good state to look at. Um, and I'm using obesity here, but we, again, I can, we can do this in real time immediately for any of those particular risk factors. So if you said, what about diabetes, what about heart disease, dyslipidemia, we can do it in a second. It's a mere click of a button. Um, and what you can see here, so prevalence here, the years of our study here, the dotted line is our prediction, the red line is the actual. And remember what happens is it learns here and says, okay, I think it's going to go here. And what it'll do is when the prevalence for next year comes up, it says, oh, I got that wrong. I'll adjust and try again and try again. So it's a constant learning model year on year. I'll just show you some of the data here. I'll just try and show you some of the data here. There we go. And what you can see, I think, what you can see is that the model is really catching up to the line in real time. So you can see the convergence between what actually happened in the population and what the model was predicting would happen. Can you see that? So one, one thing you might say is, well, that's a pretty good approximation. That's not bad. And actually, it is, it is um, pretty amazing, particularly in terms of uh, machine learning efforts. But actually, it's not predicting a lot of variance, because there's only a 2 to 3% variance year on year. So you know, big whoop. This shows it a slightly different way. This is diabetes, and there's a lot to look at here, so let me just walk you through it. This is diabetes prevalence. CDC is the measured. This is our prediction, and this is the difference, and this is for 2011 across a bunch of states, and the table shows all the states, but I've just cut and pasted the top. 
This is 2012, the CDC prediction, sorry, CDC measured data, the prediction and the difference. And your Mark I eyeball will look at that and see that the differences have reduced from 2011 to 2012. In other words, the model is getting smarter at making a prediction that's accurate. So year on year, it's getting smarter in the way that the machine learning works. The other thing you, I think you'll see is that the difference between predicting a particular prevalence for an area based on how people use the internet and an actual measured value is virtually nothing, less than 1% in most cases. This is all NCD risks for all of the United States. I'm showing this for a couple of reasons. One, because of the variance in estimates over time. You can see reductions here, and, and this might look quite similar to a reductions in heart disease over a similar period of time. But for all of the US and for all risks, you can see pretty much it's an identical approximation. The predicted model pretty much gives you the same story as the actual measured data. OK, so what? Well, one of the things that this allows you to do is to take that measure at any point in time. I can ask for a particular region, what's it like today? What's it like next week? What's it like the week after? If I introduce a major intervention this week, I want to know what it's like yesterday and I want to know what it's like next week, not in three years when we've collected data and done all that cleaning. One argument is we can do that. But there are other ways you could also get that sort of information. Another way, and a typical way of doing it, is a computer-assisted telephone interview or a CATI. And most people will have heard of a Morgan Gallup poll. Many people will have been called to ask their views on, on various things. Again, a busy slide, apologies, but let me talk you through it. Each of these are states, you can see here, of the United States. Year is across the bottom. This is prevalence of any NCD, but the pictures look the same for diabetes, or dyslipidemia, or stroke, or heart disease, or physical activity, and so on and so on. We've got our prediction, which is the blue line, CDC's measured line, and remember the model is learning off the CDC data as a, to try and learn how to predict, and the next best op option if you're trying to do this, which is a telephone survey. Telephone surveys are notoriously inaccurate. That's the first thing you can see from this picture. The Gallup line, the telephone line, and the measured data don't match at all. The prediction outperforms the telephone line by about five to one. Okay, let me just show you this a slightly different way. These are the same risk factors down the left-hand side here from our original picture. These are the years, and these are correlations um, in terms of the predicted versus the actual measured. And I think any statisticians in the audience would get extremely excited by um, correlations above 0.6. So for a measure to be correlated with another measure above 0.6 is what you'd call a strong correlation. 0.8, you ring the paper and say, I think I'm going to do a media release. 0.9, you're really talking about something that has pretty high um, associative validity, is pretty high associated between the two. Um, and really, that's just showing overall across the whole lot, we're talking 0.91. But when we take these numbers to our statistician and they see 0.94, they start doing a little dance. They get very, very excited about things. So let's go back to the scary stuff. I mean, what, what we've just shown you there is our ability to look at the way people use the internet, to look at the way they search some 1,400 search terms, and whether or not that's actually predictive of their behaviour. I would argue the answer is yes, and very strongly so, but it takes some maths beyond what we've been able to do until very recently with big computing and machine learning to make it fly. The argument against big data is that Big Brother is watching and they know what we're up to and it's all surveillance and so on and so on. Well, it shouldn't really be news to you that that's already what's happening. That's why when you search at a website, the marketing is fairly accurately targeted to who you are and to your age group and so on and so on and so on. I don't get very many ads for um, aged care, but because my ten -year -old, uh, uh, we have 10-year-olds who look at my computer, I get a lot of ads for Lego. And that's not an accident, right? So this technology, this thinking, this approach is already being used over and over again. We're just not applying it to understanding health. I think that's a really important point to make. We're going through the discussions now with the internet providers to say, hey, we need to see whether this works in Australia. Will you let us at the data? And to get into the room, the first question is, well, how are we going to protect anonymity? 
it's not a question of anonymity. This, th these data are largely readily available, and I'm going to show you that in a slightly different way. I'm not calling Healthy Together Victoria or Healthy Together Geelong a natural experiment. I'm just saying this information could be useful in natural experiments. Healthy Together Victoria and Healthy Together Geelong is what I'm going to talk about, and, and two of my good friends from that uh, intervention are here at the moment sets a series of things to try and do systems change. They include leadership, resourcing, workforce, data, and most importantly, networks. So one of the key things people try and influence is the networks around a particular intervention. Without asking, without getting permission, without getting a plain language statement, without consent forms, without anything else, and in about two minutes, all you need to do is know where to look, and you can generate a picture like this. This is people who communicate via comments in Healthy Together's Facebook page and how they're connected to each other. Last 500 posts. But I could tell you what this was two days into Healthy Together. I could tell you what this was six months in, a year in, a day after they tried a new social marketing campaign, the day before, and so on and so on and so on. We're doing some work at the minute in the Great South Coast. We can do this if we have access to one person's email records. We can answer the question, is this generating any conversation? Is this changing the network at all? And, and more and more we're pointing to the importance of changing networks as being pretty critical. I'll show you a different way. This is Healthy Together Geelong. And I'm sorry, this is really hard to see. This is Healthy Together Geelong in 2012. And this is the network online. And again, they don't know I was going to present this. And this is freely available. I'm probably going to get in trouble for doing it. But frankly, I could have done it for anything. I just happened to pick something I knew. And because I think it'll actually be useful. This is about the second or third week of operation of Healthy Together. What you can't really see is the lines between these different points. But the big node there is the Healthy Together Geelong website. And that's the Facebook page. And that's the way people are interacting with it. First obvious thing to say is there's not much going on. Not surprising there was. Chad, three people maybe early on? Not many, anyway. Let's fast forward a year. I don't know whether you can see it very well, but you can see there's a lot more people actively engaged at that particular point in time, and the connections between them are starting to strengthen. So you can start to see very different connections and communication going on. We've done this work in maternal and child health nurses where a region had four different breastfeeding policies in operation. Now, there was only one policy that was validated, vindicated, and supported by the leadership in that region. But when we went out and said, what do maternal and child health nurses tell people in practice, they use four different policies. We did a network analysis, and what we found is there were four different gatekeepers that shared four different policies. Those gatekeepers were the people who um, brought everyone together for a cup of tea each Friday afternoon in four different groups and chatted about their practice. What's the intervention? It's not a rocket saying, why aren't you following the policy? It's not a missive in a newsletter saying, here's our policy. It's bringing those four gatekeepers together and saying, you know, we've noticed that your different networks use different policies. That has to change. Let me just show you Healthy Together Victoria yesterday. Uh, sorry, Healthy Together Geelong yesterday. It's a little bit hard to see again, but you can see, look at these flares here. Like, whatever they're doing there is really working if the intention is to get people engaged. No question, right? Whatever they're doing there is really working, no question. What do they have to do with these things to get them to there? One of the points to make about this is we could do this now and in 10 minutes and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and we could see what it was like a week ago, a month ago and so on and so on and so on. It's freely available and you can do it in about a minute. Um, time? How long have I got? 11 minutes, perfect. Let me just change gears again and talk a little bit about complexity. So there's been, most people will have started been hearing people talk about systems and the importance of engaging with complexity and the difficulty of understanding all the multiple drivers and, and you know, it's, it's just very hard to get everything in the right box at the right time and pushing in the right direction. One of the pieces of work we've been doing in the Great South Coast is trying to understand what all the different parts of a system are that you need to consider, use, adapt and press on to get change to happen. And what I'm going to just show you is, is a complex picture of the drivers of obesity in Portland. And it looks like this. I say it looks like this. I might get you to... Oh. 
sorry about that. It looks like this. Now that looks like a horrible great big spaghetti map. The fail that we've had in most public health population health interventions in the past is linear models with single or, or binary endpoints, i.e. tell kids to eat healthy food, they'll eat healthy food, their weight will improve, which doesn't take into account the food system, the, the shops in their area, uh, socioeconomic disparity, you, you know, we all know these things, but the problem is we all fall into mechanistic randomised trial, trial models of doing things. What this shows is a grounded model of all the drivers in that community that they feel drive obesity. This is a picture of their system and the interconnectedness of their system. Some of these things are already measured in a routine way. Some of these things aren't. As a result of the work we've done with them, they've got more than 250 different single activities happening in multiple different places of this map. So that's a fundamental step change from the single, interven single programmatic intervention response to a whole of system change. But how on earth do you measure that in a way that it supports implementation? Great, you've got a systems map, congratulations, you're doing 205 things and in two and a half years we'll tell you what your obesity prevalence was when you started. Useless. You put the monitoring system together with big data and you can actually tell people how the elements of their system are changing in response to intervention in real time. If we can do this for behaviours, why can't we do it for social determinants? Why can't we do it for all of the different things that that community sees as critical to changing their system to preventing ill health in their kids? Ill health in their kids where their prevalence of overweight and obesity is ten times what it would have been when we were kids. Now they're facing life expectancy reductions of 20 to 30 years and we're still, just, we're still not taking it seriously. We need to throw everything we've got at these problems and that includes this sort of work. Sorry, got all heavy there for a second, beg your pardon. Um, let's look at it a slightly different way. The bottom left is the cloud, right? Everything you've done on your phone has gone through the cloud or gone through a wireless transceiver or gone through the Craig's Hotel wireless which goes through a bunch of wires, which goes through a Telstra exchange, which goes to Telstra, which then gets dumped and deleted or sold to a marketing firm. The streams of information that are flowing directly under the nose of our internet providers are massive. And what I've just shown you, I hope, in this presentation is they're incredibly valuable to understand health. They're actually potential for us to use them for real-time implementation support is, is endless. Um, I should also say that you know some of this has been slightly hard to follow, so I'm glad you talked about visualisation before. We've now got a PhD student who's solely working on visualisation of data. That's, that's their purpose. Their, their purpose is how do we get this complex data, make sense of it, and then present it in a way that it's actually useful in real time. I, I think another one of the failings we've made is, look how clever we are, I can do a big picture. It's not actually that useful if, if it has no practical use. And people will know about um, Google Maps. You can now digitise an area from Google Maps, from Google Pictures, and you can tell the fast food density, you can tell the, the, um, the width of the footpaths, you can tell all those different environmental measures that used to take us ages and ages of field work to collect, collate and clean. We can actually digitise that and get it virtually in real time. We can't, but it is possible. And you know, the other thing is your phone will tell us where you went, how fast you went there, and if we do a bit of clever thinking about it, your mode of transport. So let me finish with a summary. The data I've shown you from the US show that the way people use the internet, what they search for on the internet, is strongly and highly predictive of their NCD outcomes, their NCD risks and their behavioural risks. It's a strong proxy. There's no systematic bias in that because it's everybody. We get a 30% sample of kids We've, we're missing 70% of them. Which 70% are we missing? The ones with the problem, almost inevitably. We've, we've made the mistake of thinking there's a plateau because of the problem with response rates. With a 91% response rate, we can tell you there's no plateau. But we can't tell you what it is in a week and a week and a week. And with this pro technique, we can. Um, so what? Well, this is free or cheap. You know, those HTV pictures I showed you, we did yesterday. And I said to my analyst, can you do one for last week? Can you do one for last year? Yep, click, click. It was that easy. Um, it's publicly available. It's virtually real time. So we can actually say what's changing in response to intervention and so on. 
It means we can give immediate feedback to intervention. And this is the really critical thing. So many interventions, so many public movements, so many good policy ideas wither on the vine because a politician asked the question, it happened to us, prove it's changed someone's BMI. I can't, that takes two years. Or we're changing the system. Nonsense you are, how are you changing the system? Well, I can show you because the people's behaviour has changed fundamentally as a result of what we've done. And here's when it changed, and here's how it's changed, and here's why it changed. We've never been able to do that before. We can also do predictions ahead of the measured data. You train one of these models and you can follow it over time. Um, and then I've got some sort of horrible typo situation going on down the bottom there. What I hope I've made the case for, though, is that this... Uh, I hope you're not frightened, but even if you are, these data are ubiquitous and other people are using them for their ends. It's time that we got really serious about using the full potential to support prevention of chronic disease. That's what I think the value is, and that's the thing I think we really need to consider and put our weight behind. Thank you very much for your attention, and I just want to acknowledge the funding bodies in particular, the Western Alliance. Thank you.